Okay, I would like to welcome everybody to our last workshop, uh, but not the final one because, as you know, uh, not the final meeting because, as you know, there will be the conference in, uh, in Tilburg in February, so also there we will be again together. I would also like to welcome very much the PhD students from the University of Bologna, PhD students in uh, European tax law. Today, as you know, um, we will speak about the notion of legitimate expectations and how national, what is the competence that national judges have when applying uh, the, this concept of uh, legitimate expectations. As you know, as always, when you have questions, uh, comments, please just interrupt me. Um, what is our agenda for this morning? Yes, we will start by uh, analyzing the new notion of legitimate expectation as uh, uh, it has been developed in the case law of the Court of Justice of the European uh, Union. Um, and this will be uh, the main focus of the first part of this morning session. During the second part, we will focus more specifically on the competence of national judges. So we'll specifically deal on what a national judge can do when, when dealing with the notion of legitimate expectations. And uh, uh, this afternoon we will have a very interesting discussion on the application of the concept of legitimate expectations to individual tax rulings, also in light of the most recent uh, decisions of the, uh, of the uh, Commission. The legislative point of reference for the application of the EU notion of legitimate expectations in matter of state aid is Article 16, Paragraph 1 of the Procedural Regulation as amended in 2015. And this article establishes that the Commission shall not require recovery of the aid if this would be contrary to a general principle of union law. And it is unanimously accepted, recognized, that legitimate expectations is one of these general principles. This means that the Commission cannot order the recovery if this recovery would breach the legitimate expectations of the beneficiary of the end. And as we will see during the second morning uh, session, this provision has been extended expressly by the Court of Justice also to national court, which means that also national judges cannot order a recovery when this recovery would breach legitimate expectations. But this is something we will focus more specifically later this morning. Now, it is important to say that there is no legislative definition of the EU concept of legitimate expectation. Therefore, the concept that we will discuss is a concept which has been developed by the Court of Justice in its case law. And this is the case law that indeed we will analyze and uh, uh, discuss. However, before dealing with the case law of the Court of Justice, it is important first of all to point out the theoretical background which has led the Court of Justice to certain findings in matters of legitimate expectations. First of all, we need to clarify the function of the concept of legitimate expectation. The EU concept of legitimate expectation has the main uh, function of protecting the economic operators carrying on activities within uh, the, uh, the internal market against the discretionary power of institutions, of the EU institutions. And we know that indeed, for example, the Commission, when conducting its compatibility assessment, has indeed a certain margin of discretionality, mainly when the economic analysis is carried on. If we think also about the very recent decision of the Commission, it is clear that uh, there is a certain uh, margin of uh, discretionality. For example, when uh, the Court of Justice uh, uh, 
establishes that under certain uh, conditions, uh, the cap method should apply instead of the uh, transactional net margin method. So we see few institutions uh, have discretionality, may have discretionality when, uh, and mainly the commission may have discretionality when conducting the, the assessment uh, uh, the assessment proceeding. Legitimate expectations have essentially the functions of guaranteeing the foreseeability for economic operators. The foreseeability of indeed EU state aid law. So this is the main function. There is also another important aspect to, to clarify, which is that legitimate expectations only have relevance when uh, an aid is unlawful, so when an aid has been unlawful implemented. And this derives from the procedures uh, contained in Article 108, Paragraph 3 of the Treaty on the Function of the European Union. According to that provision, any measure which is prima facie an aid must be notified to the uh, Commission. And only if the Commission concludes the procedure with a positive assessment, which means the aid is considered compatible with the internal market, that measure can be actually implemented. So only from the moment in which the Commission has decided that has assessed that the measure is compatible. And only if the measure is compatible, the, 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 the aid can be implemented. Therefore, if the procedure under Article 108, Paragraph 3 is followed, there is actually no reason, no relevance for recovery, and consequently no relevance for legitimate expectations, according to Article 16 of the procedural, of the procedural regulation. Therefore, uh, yes, it is, it is clear that legitimate expectations are only relevant when there is need of a recovery and in uh, connection with the need of recovery. Consequently, the uh, reasoning of the Court of Justice in uh, developing the uh, the notion of uh, legitimate expectations is exactly based on Article 108, Paragraph 3 of the Treaty on the Functioning of the European Union. The main reasoning with which we, uh, on which we will focus more specifically uh, uh, soon is the following. The procedural rule contained in Article 108, Paragraph 3 is a clear obligation of notifying any measure which is a prima facie aid. It is a clear procedural rule and therefore any diligent economic operator is able to know whether a certain measure has been notified or not. This also because, as often the court points out, this notification, this information is given in the official journal of the European Union. Therefore, any diligent economic operator is able to know if this notification has taken place or, uh, or not. Consequently, the court states, a diligent economic operator can claim legitimate expectations only very exceptionally. And that's why the Court of Justice, in its case law, constantly refer to exceptional circumstances. Only exceptional circumstances can give rise to legitimate expectations. Commission versus Germany is actually uh, the, uh, the, the judgment in, uh, in which the Court of Justice has issued some of the uh, rulings which are still at the basis of the case law of the Court of Justice uh, concerning uh, 
the definition, the drawing of the notion of uh, legitimate expectations. The Commission, through a new, uh, only through some newspaper, that uh, Germany had uh, uh, granted to a German company subsidies and credit guarantees. The Commission asked information to Germany, which confirmed that in fact, in fact those measures were granted to the German, the German company. Consequently, in 1987, the Commission issued a decision in which the aid was assessed as unlawful and incompatible, and consequently, indeed, the Commission ordered the uh, recovery. However, Germany did not uh, appeal the decision, but it did not even uh, recover the aid. And for this reason, the Commission started proceedings before the Court of Justice in order to assess, uh, uh, to make the Court uh, assess that uh, uh, Germany had uh, breached the treaty because uh, it, it did not had implemented the, uh, the decision of the, of the Commission. And Germany defense was uh, substantially based on uh, national law because Germany uh, stated that the German, therefore the national cause of legitimate expectation, did not allow uh, the German authorities to order recovery. Let's see what was the reply of the court. The court ruled, and I would like to read with you because this is one of the fundamental passages used by uh, the court and which is actually repeated in any judgment, also in the most, uh, the most recent ones. It must be noted that in view of the mandatory nature of the supervision of state aid by the Commission under Article 93, which is now under 8, undertakings to which a name has been granted may not in principle entertain a legitimate expectation that the aid is lawful unless it has been granted in compliance with the procedure laid down in that act. A diligent businessman should normally be able to determine whether the procedure has been followed. This is the core passage which explains the position of the Court of Justice in matters of legitimate expectations. The reasoning is, as we have just read, there is a procedural rule. This procedural rule is rather clear and uh, it has the purpose of guaranteeing that any national measure that may be made is checked and assessed by the Commission. In light of this, legitimate expectation can arise only exceptionally, because only exceptionally a diligent businessman does not know that uh, this procedure has been uh, followed. So, this is the main reasoning of the court in matter of legitimate expectation. There is also another passage which is important and that clarifies the position. The court states, it is also true that a recipient of the legal granted aid is not precluded from relying on exceptional circumstances on the basis of which it had legitimately assumed that the aid to be lawful and thus declining to refund that aid. If such a case is brought that court to assess the material circumstances if necessary after obtaining a preliminary ruling on interpretation from the Court of Justice. Another very important passage. Legitimate expectations uh, can arise only in exceptional circumstances. <coughs> 
But indeed, it is important to protect legitimate expectations. This legitimate expectation must be protected also by national courts. And when these, when these national courts are competent and acting as EU courts, it is up to them to apply, uh, to evaluate whether these circumstances are exceptional or not. In addition, always in Commission versus Germany, the Court of, the, the Court of Justice states that it is not up to a member state to rely on the legitimate expectations of the beneficiary. This is also something very important that a national, that also a national judge should take into consideration. It's not the member state that can claim the legitimate expectations of the beneficiary. Only the beneficiary can claim, well, you should not order the recovery because I was legitimately expected that the aid was lawful. So the court distinguishes clearly the position of the member state from the position of the beneficiary. And as we will see also in another case, the reason, the main reason is that during the compatibility assessment, the member state is always in contact, directly in contact with the Commission. So for the member state, is more clear what the position of the Commission will be. But the beneficiary is only indirectly involved in the assessment of the Commission. This is only one of the reasons for this distinction in the position of the member state and the, the, the beneficiary. I say only one because it is clear, and, this is, and these are mainly the cases that involve national, national courts, that legitimate expectations, we will see it immediately, may concern uh, uh, only the period of the standstill clause, so before a procedure of the Commission actually starts. Because, but we will see it mainly during the second part, indeed, the main uh, function of national courts is to protect the beneficiary for the period before the assessment is, uh, is meant. Because we know that at the, at the end it will be the Commission which will order the recovery. But how to protect beneficiaries or competitors of the beneficiaries before that period? This is something we will focus on uh, very, specifically, very specifically later. Now we go on with the EU notion of legitimate expectation. Because here the Court said, the Court of Justice said also something which is very important for national, for national court. And it states that Germany cannot rely on national law in order to justify the breach of EU law. In case which have EU relevance, only the EU notion of legitimate expectations, which is the notion the court develops, can be applied even by national judges when these national judges indeed act as EU judges, so in cases which have EU relevance. These are the main findings of the court in this case. The findings that, uh, as I said, represent the basis, the fundament of the case law uh, in matter of so, these points which I would like to read with you are legitimate expectations of the beneficiary of a state aid cannot be claimed by the member states which are lawfully granted the aid in order to avoid recovery. Very important point. 
legitimate expectations can only be entertained by the beneficiary of the aid in exceptional circumstances. In national proceedings, it is up to the national courts to evaluate, to evaluate the occurrence of these exceptional circumstances. In EU proceedings, national courts must apply the EU notion of legitimate expectations <coughs> and not the national one. Is it everything clear until now? Do you have questions? Uh, this afternoon, the uh, ladies uh, are yes. dealing with these as well in the, in the testimony case, and then we can also look mm -hmm. at some particular cases to, to understand. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Yes, yes, indeed, now we are developing the theoretical framework yeah. and then we will see how these apply more. Um, but what do you mean with national courts is EU, EU courts uh, between those markets? I mean that uh, uh, there are uh, cases in which national courts act as a new court because it applies and it guarantees the correct application of EU law. So, under EU law, it is said that in this case, a national courts act as an EU court. This is something very important that uh, we will point it out. Yeah. We will point out again because uh, uh, what uh, it is expressly said under EU law is that the role of national court in state aid in general. In the, with concern to legitimate expectations more specifically, is a complementary yeah. is a complementary role. So it's not a secondary role, it's a complementary. National courts, we will see it very, very clearly uh, a little bit later, deals with protection of beneficiaries in a specific moment, which is the moment before the decision, in which no, uh, no other uh, EU institution has competence. And therefore, it is only up to national courts which have an obligation. And that's why it is important to understand the EU notion of legitimate expectation, because this is exactly the notion that national judges must apply, they have an obligation to apply, in order to protect beneficiaries in the period before. Yeah, and, that, and that's why you state that in such a situation a national court is to be considered as a EU court. Is that yes. what you mean? Yeah. Yes, because there are cases in which the, the, the national judge is not substituting any, any EU institution. It is, it is taking an autonomous de decision, which can only be taken by a national court. And the legitimate expectation is exactly one of those cases. And in the second part, we will, we will emphasize and we will see very, very specifically what, uh, what I'm speaking about. Uh, but yes, uh, the, first of all, indeed, it is important to clarify what is the notion of legitimate expectation which is, uh, which is uh, applicable. And this is, what, this is the starting point. There is a rule, only exceptionally that rule cannot apply. Because that rule has the function of guarantee that uh, the, the, the measures are assessed by the Commission. So that's the priority, let's say. Then, only exceptionally, we can recognize that uh, that rule may be uh, not applied. Mm -hmm. Because indeed, the recovery is the consequence of the... Well, the I, I think the assessment. same principle, the, the, the national principle is the same, but in the end, it's a much broader, broader. Uh, uh, appliance. Uh, yes. Yeah, the Court of Justice values more the effectiveness of the EU. Yeah, 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 absolutely. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 We will yeah. see that in the case, though, there is constant reference to the effectiveness of the yeah. EU. The reason why it is exceptional is that uh, member state, the, the reason is that uh, the, uh, for which uh, uh, the position of member state is, uh, the position of the court vis-a-vis -a, -vis a member state is stricter, 
is exactly because, because EU law recognizes uh, up to member states to guarantee notification. And that's why the court says we cannot accept that the state claim legitimate expectation because this would imply that we accept that the state can justify itself for not having notified the measure. And the court states, if we would allow this, Article 100, 108 would lose its effectiveness. Yes. And indeed, But on the other hand, there is the Commission, which is the only one, exceptionally in the Council, that uh, can assess the compatibility. So what happens if there is a conflict? Well, I can anticipate that, in principle, EU law must always prevail. This is also in light of the principle of loyal cooperation. So, let's say, for example, if a court of first instance decides that there is, uh, that it cannot order the recovery because of legitimate expectations. But after that, there is a decision of the Commission, and uh, the Commission, on the contrary, considers the, 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 the aid uh, unlawful, but does not recognize legitimate expectations and therefore orders uh, the recall. What happens? What should the national court do in this situation? This is not really clarified in the procedural rules of EU law, but there are some, uh, some principles. One is indeed privacy of the law, the other one is uh, loyal cooperation. So the Commission, for example, looks in the, in the 2009 notice on the role of, of the national court suggests that in this case, if, for example, the, uh, the proceedings go on and uh, a national, uh, a, a second, uh, a court of appeal uh, must decide, in this case, if the court of appeal does not agree with the commission, uh, the court of appeal may uh, ask a preliminary question to the court of justice in order to avoid conflict. So there is a little bit the, law, the, the principle of royal cooperation, which does not solve <coughs> always the, the, the situation, but this is what it uh, suggested, lacking a very precise procedural, procedural rule. And indeed, we also have to take into consideration the Kini case, which has said that, in any case, if the judge decides after the Commission has issued its decision, the national judge uh, can never uh, judge in conflict with the, with the decision of the Commission, even if uh, the national, the national uh, judgment would be res judicata. So, if there is a judgment, it has become nationally res judicata and it follows a, uh, commission, a decision of the Commission. This decision is maybe uh, appealed, so in the end there is the Court of Justice that decides. If the decision of the Court of Justice is contrary to the decision of the Commission, uh, sorry, to the decision of the national judge, and uh, even if the judgment is res judicata, EU law prevails. 
So there are some rules, although really not all conflicts are solvable under the present procedural rules of EU law. And we will also deal with this more specifically in, in the second part. But yes, it's a very crucial point for, for national for national for national courts. The national courts cannot play on the base of our national principle. We are not able to talk. Yeah. That's that's the thing. All we have to take into consideration yeah. the EU As I said, yeah. even when even when the judgment has been the decision has been if there is a conflict with EU law, EU law must prevail. But indeed, there are also intermediary situations that, again, are not completely solvable um, by the EU procedural, uh, procedural rules. And we will see there is, there is even some inconsistency, I think, between uh, the, the, the judgment of the Court of Justice. But, yes, I just said, but, and this is what, uh, this is also the purpose of this morning, national judges have always an important tool, which is preliminary questions. And in this, I would say that the court of, uh, the, 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 the role of national courts as EU courts uh, is also a role as EU court to, develop, to help developing EU law through preliminary questions to, to the Court of Justice. Also in these, national courts uh, exercise their competence as EU court. This is something that actually also the Court of Justice always emphasizes. Preliminary ruling, through preliminary rulings, national courts have an extremely important tool in order to clarify and situations and there are many many situations concerning the relationship that the, the relationship between national and EU institutions national courts and the commission and EU courts that may really be clarified through preliminary rulings and this is something that we will point out this morning as well what may national courts ask as a preliminary ruling please decision has become uh, definitive because uh, the, the, uh, any, de any decision of the Commission can be appealed within two months from the date of notification. If it's not uh, appealed by one of the parties which is directly and individually affected by that, uh, that decision, the decision is definitive. In this case, the only possibility, so there is no possibility for national, for national courts to decide in conflict with the decision with the decision of the Commission. The only thing that the parties involved in the, the uh, affected by the decision can do is claim damages against a new institution for damages. There is, a, there is an EU procedures for damages against EU institutions. I don't know, are other questions? Okay. Um, so, yes, indeed, now it is very important to see when those exceptional circumstances are recognized by the Court of Justice as 
giving rise to legitimate exploitation. RSV versus Commission is the very first case in which the Court of Justice has recognized the existence of legitimate expectations. RSV uh, was a Dutch company with its registered office in Rotterdam and it was involved in uh, uh, activities concerning shipbuilding, ship repair and, and heavy engineering uh, activities. The company was, rece was receiving aid already from 1977. This is a case of 1985. So as from 1977, uh, the company was receiving aid from the Dutch government, indeed, but under a restructuring program which had been uh, uh, approved by the, the Commission. So, so it was an aid, but the aid had indeed been considered compatible, approved by, by the Commission. Uh, RSV at the entire group was incurring losses and therefore in 1979 the Dutch government decided to incorporate a new company in order to take over those activities. But the losses increased and then the, the Dutch government in 1980s simply decided not to incorporate anymore the, the company, not to take over the activities, but just uh, terminate the activities of RSV and uh, its group. So, um, RSV uh, was, uh, uh, became the supervisor of the group in order to coordinate the termination of of the group. And uh, in order to cover the costs that uh, RSV was incurring in, for, for the supervision and termination, the last phase of the group, the Dutch government decided to grant additional aid to, to the company. Aid which were meant, as I said, to cover the additional costs for terminating the activities of, of the group. This new aid was notified to the Commission. But it took 26 months for the Commission to decide that the aid was incompatible, because in the end it was, the aid was assessed as incompatible. It takes 26 months, so more than two, uh, more than two years. The aid, as I said, was assessed as incompatible and therefore RSV appealed the decision of the Commission and it claimed legitimate expectation. And in this case, the Court of Justice acknowledged that because it took 26 months for uh, uh, the Commission to decide, this delay could determine the legitimate expectation that the aid was in the end But it is clear from, from the subsequent case law of the Court of Justice that it's not the delay as such that can justify legitimate expectations. And this is mainly clear from the subsequent case, Germany versus Commission. In this case, it took more than three years for the Commission to start, to even start the formal procedure of assessment. So the aid was notified, but in the end it took more than three years for the Commission to officially decide to start the formal, the formal procedure. But in this case, the Court of Justice did not recognize the legitimate expectations, because the Court of Justice said that this case was um, different from the RSV versus Commission case. Only in the RSV versus Commission case there were exceptional circumstances. Why? Because the court says, as from 1977, the concerned sector was receiving aid approved by the Commission from the Dutch government. The new aid, 
the new decision concerned new aid to cover additional costs connected to the same operation. I will explain more, more precisely. I, I already said that RSV was already receiving aid, that our uh, restructuring um, program was already approved, and we said that there were only, that the new aid only concerned uh, additional costs. Uh, they were granted only to cover additional costs, but under the same restructuring program. So, in RSV versus Commission, uh, the Commission defended itself by stating, well, it's true, it took very long to decide, but it was because the operation was, uh, uh, in which RSV was involved and the entire group was involved, was extremely complicated. Uh, and, and therefore it took time to understand the, uh, the, the, the problem, the operation, and to make a final decision. What the court replied was, yes, it's true, the operation was very complex, but you had already examined that operation before, when in 1977 you decided that uh, the, uh, the, um, the restructuring operation could be approved. So that was an operation that you already uh, knew. There was no additional, additional analysis to, uh, to, to make. And this is exactly the reasons why the, com the, the court considered only RSV versus Commission in RSV versus Commission existing legitimate expectations. In addition, in Germany versus Commission, the court states that legitimate expectations of the recipient cannot be compared to the legitimate expectations of the state. Again, why? Because Germany as I said, notified the aid, and therefore it was constantly in contact with the Commission. So what the court uh, uh, states, in this situation, we cannot say that Germany had a legitimate expectation that the aid was compatible, because Germany was constantly in contact with the state. This is not the situation of the recipient, sorry, with the, with the Commission. This is not... A, the, the, the position of the recipient, because the recipient, as we said, is not directly involved by uh, the commission in the assessment procedure. That's why the position in claiming legitimate expectation is different. Yes. I would like to share an example from, from the Netherlands, which I think is interesting to hear about it. Yeah, indeed. In 2000, I believe it was 2008, the Dutch government wanted to Final 
decision because sometimes the, the, the beneficiary doesn't know. <laughs> well, it's a, first, first of all, if 10 years, uh, well, it, it, we also have to consider the, 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 prescription, the prescription period, but uh, because uh, after 10 years, after, after the, the, the Commission knows about, about a, certain, a certain measure, uh, recovery cannot be ordered anymore. There is a 10 years that could be, uh, that could be uh, something, something uh, relevant. I, 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 it is difficult to say if only on the basis that it was a public news, um, a beneficiary can exclude legitimate expectations. Probably, I would say, it would be important to take more closely into consideration the relationship between the beneficiary and the state. We should also evaluate another very, very important case, in which, again, this is another one of the other rare cases in which legitimate expectations were acknowledged by the, the court, which is the case uh, concerning the situation in which the beneficiary has received precise assurances um, from one EU institution. And this was the case in the very important case concerning the Belgian coordination centers. Uh, as we know, coordination centers, which were, uh, which existed not only in Belgium but in many other EU member states, were companies which could enjoy a beneficial um, fiscal regime. For example, uh, in, uh, in Belgium, uh, the coordination uh, centers could enjoy a favorable uh, determination of taxable income on the basis of the cost plus methods. They were exempted from taxation on, uh, as the Belgian judges certainly know, they were exempted uh, from uh, tax on uh, the property of the buildings they were using for their professional uh, activities or, for example, the dividend, interest and royalties uh, distributed were exempted uh, with some exception from uh, taxation. So there, were, uh, there was a series of advantages recognized to the coordination, coordination side. It was relatively easy to enjoy these, uh, these advantages. Uh, it was the Belgian legislation established some uh, characteristics, for example, coordination centers had to be part of multinationals, having a certain number of employees in, uh, in Belgium, etc. etc. So, uh, existing these objective characteristics, the, uh, the company was individually allowed by the Belgian authorities to enjoy these beneficial uh, tax regime. It is important to say that in the 80s, and precisely in 1984 and 1987, the Commission was called to assess the, the, the tax regime of the coordination centers. And the Commission expressly assessed those measures as compatible with the internal market. Uh, so, there, were, there, there was uh, the so, so the Belgian regime was expressly considered compatible by the Commission in the end. In addition, in 1990, there was a parliamentary question and the Commission for, the commission for Competition expressly confirmed that the measures were compatible. But then, in 1997, the policy changed completely. The Code of Conduct was uh, uh, adopted and uh, the Commission started to review some delegate national measures. <coughs> the coordination centers was one of those measures. And for this reason, the Commission started again the assessment procedure and in 2003, the Belgian coordination center regimes were considered incompatible. 
That's why, well, but as we said, this is important to say, legitimate expectation in this, expectations in this case were expressly acknowledged by the Commission. And the Commission uh, stated that those coordination centers which were enjoying the, ta the favorable tax regime on the 31st December of 2000 could enjoy this regime until 2010. These were dates established by the Council, so that's why these are the terms. It was a, a political decision of the Council. The reason why the Commission recognized legitimate expectations is indeed there were precise assurances. On the basis of these assurances, coordination centers made investments, structured their group in a certain way, concluded uh, agreements with third parties. Therefore, we need to guarantee, we need to give them time to dismiss this organization. And that's why legitimate expectations were recognized, were acknowledged by the Commission, on the basis of precise assurances and in order to guarantee time to the, to the companies to dismiss their organization and investment. But still, the, deci the decision of the Commission was appealed by the Belgium, Belgian Kingdom and Forum 187, which was an association representing the Belgian coordination centers. Because they wanted that, uh, the legitimate, they asked for the court to decide that legitimate expectations were extended also to other coordination centers. And in fact, the court extended legitimate expectations and it ruled that they could, have, they could be acknowledged also to those coordination centers which had already applied for renewal because the, we didn't say this before, but uh, the, the regime uh, were granted individually on the basis of a, a Belgian uh, decree. It, the, the, uh, the authorization lasted 10 years and it could be renewed for 10 more years. So, the court said that legitimate expectations could be acknowledged also to those coordination centers which at the moment of the notification of the decision of the Commission had already applied for renewal or whose authorization expired at the moment of the decision or just after. Why the court decided to extend legitimate expectation? Exactly because of what we said earlier. Because the authorization regime was almost automatic on the basis of the existence of, of certain conditions, subjective conditions, uh, number of employees, uh, dimensions, etc., the regime was almost automatically granted. There was no discretionality, this is what the court emphasized, uh, from national authorities. For this reason, it was legitimate for those coordination centers to expect that, there, that a renewal would have been granted for Belgium from Belgian uh, authorities. And that's why the court extended even further the acknowledgement of legitimate expectations in this, in this case. And, and how far exactly? Um, was there a, a because, uh, because the commi or? Yes, because the commission said legitimate expectations can be recognized only to those centers yeah. which were enjoying the regime yeah. on the 31st yeah. of December 2000. Yes. The court said even those coordination centers which had only asked for a renewal, so yeah. the, they yeah. were not, uh, uh, according to the commission, they would have not been able yeah. to obtain the renewal. Yeah. The court said yes, because they, were ex they could expect that the renewal wa was almost automatic. So for, for those companies, um, they had a 10-year extra period? Uh, in fact, yes. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. 
in the commission of the decision in the decision of the commission was until the end no longer than 2010 for the court was yes 10 more years but no farther than 2010 because that that deadline was decided previously yeah. by the council Yes, the court also said that in any case, legitimate expectations can only be acknowledged if there are no overriding public interests of the EU which must prevail over the interest of the beneficiaries. Also in this respect, the, 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 the court is it's vague, it's not a clear, uh, these uh, overriding public interests are not clearly mentioned, at least with specific reference to to, to state aid, but we can imagine that uh, in case competition policy must prevail. So, uh, indeed, there would be overriding <coughs> interest reasons connected to competition, competition policy. Um, another important uh, uh, case could be, this is, this is uh, quite often been referred to the Court of Justice, the case in which the commission, the decision of the commission is a positive decision, so according to the commission, the aid is compatible, but then either the general court or the court of justice annuls the, uh, the, 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 the decision. There were cases in which beneficiaries said, well, but on the basis of the positive decision of the commission, um, we can claim legitimate expectations. The court has always categorically excluded coherently, I would say, simply because it is very well known that the decisions of the Commission may be appealed and therefore annulled under, under, under the treaty. And yes, this is the question we, 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 have, already, uh, we have already partially, partially uh, addressed. According to the court, any diligent businessmen can understand if and when uh, a measure a uh, national uh, measure a was notified but as we said what about the qualification what if the beneficiary simply thought that uh, it was not an aid because it was objectively difficult to understand whether that uh, specific measure was an aid under article one. As said, this is something that the Commission has expressly addressed and in uh, different cases has explicitly recognized uh, legitimate expectation. This uh, issue has also been dealt by Advocate General uh, Jacobs in his opinion concerning the SFEI case, which we will deal uh, with uh, later, and it, the Advocate General stated, it is for national courts to assess whether a diligent businessman ought to have realized that the measures in question constituted aid, which could be granted only in accordance with procedure laid down by Article now 108. In the present case, it seems doubtful whether that is so. First, the measure in question are not ones which self-evidently constitute aid. Mm -hmm. So, one of the advocate generals expressly addressed this question. But in the end, in that case, the court was silent on this specific issue. So, in fact, we don't have any, uh, we don't know what the position of the court is or, uh, or may be in this specific uh, situation. And uh, as we said, preliminary ruling is always an important uh, um, tool for national courts. And this could be uh, one of the possible questions in specific circumstances. Can you repeat the question for I didn't understand it? The question is, we say, that the, we, we say that there is a procedural rule which is clear, which is 
a measure which is a prima facie aid under Article 107, Paragraph 1, must be notified. And the Court of Justice always says that any diligent businessman should be able to know. But does this presuppose that any diligent business, businessman should be able to understand whether a certain measure should be notified or not? And therefore, if a certain... According to the court, yes, but we have to consider that there are specific cases in which it is objectively difficult to understand that. So can we, get, get, can, can we give to the diligence, can we say that the diligence of the businessman should be so broad also to include such a technical, because it's not anymore a matter of diligence, but of technical knowledge about what the state aid is. So the point is, to what extent we can consider this diligence of the businessman, also to cover cases in which it is objectively difficult to understand if that measure should have been notified. Can you give an example of what you mean with a situation in which it is objectively difficult? For example, we don't know if it's uh, is selective or not. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So is, is the, the question is actually from, is the diligent businessman also a lawyer? It yeah. is also required to have such yeah. a technical competence. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 When dealing with this issue, the SFEI case is a point of defined as drawn the competence of national court with specific reference to legitimate expectations. And this is the case in which the Court of Justice has expressly said that Article 16 of the procedural regulation also applies to national judges. So, we saw, earlier, we saw earlier this morning that according to Article 16, the Commission cannot um, order the recovery when this recovery would breach the legitimate expectations of the beneficiary of, of the aid. Because we saw that legitimate expectations is one of the general principles of EU law. Well, on the basis of the judgment of the Court of Justice, we know that this article does not apply only to the Commission, but also to national judges. So also national judges cannot reorder the recovery when this would breach the legitimate expectations of the uh, uh, beneficiary. In cases with new relevance, we saw uh, national judges act as EU judges, and therefore they must apply the EU concept of legitimate expectation as developed in the case of the So the concept that we analyzed, discussed this morning, and indeed in case of doubts, the court emphasized the uh, national judges should refer preliminary questions to the courts of, uh, of justice. When dealing with the competence of national courts in matters of legitimate expectations in the fiscal state aid, in the fiscal state aid field, we should preliminarily distinguish the cases in which a national judge decides before the Commission has issued its decision, from the cases in which the national judge decides after the Commission has issued its decision. And referring to the first category, category of cases, so when the, uh, the court, the judges, the judge must uh, is called to decide before the Commission has issued its decision, we can certainly say that the Court of Justice has recognized, has emphasized the very significant role of national courts. 
the national courts, the national judges must protect the rights of those persons who are affected by a breach of Article 108, Paragraph 3. So, the rights concerning the notification proceedings. So, all, those, all the rights of those persons who are affected by the fact that the measure has not been notified or it has been implemented during the same C period. And it is important to emphasize that this is an obligation for national courts. This is expressly said by the Court of Justice. It is an obligation because, as the Court recognized already in the Costa Enel case, in the 1964, that, uh, that uh, the provision which is now included in Article 108, Paragraph 3, has direct effect. So, on the basis of the immediate enforceability of Article 108, Paragraph 3, there is an obligation of national courts uh, to protect the rights of those individuals affected by a breach of Article 108, Paragraph 3. So, we are speaking in practice, just to give a very simple example, of the case in which the competitor uh, claims before a national court that the aid is unlawful, it should have been notified, so the competitor can claim that uh, um, the, 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 the aid is not rented anymore, <coughs> but the recovery is all. So the national authority order the recovery and then the beneficiary can uh, appeal the uh, recovery and uh, ask, for example, to uh, stop it because of its legitimate expectation, <coughs> not to implement the recovery order because of the legitimate expectation. Yes. So this sounds very obligatory and it will be, it is, it is, it is. but uh, can you explain how this obligation <coughs> is to be related The, the, the court has expressly said that there is an obligation. So it's not a matter of ex officio, only there is a matter of ex officio for one aspect, which is the identification of the measure. So if the measure is an aid, uh, which must be notified. But in this case, the court has expressly said that it is up to the national judge to do so. So this is something that the court can do. Indeed, the, the, the evaluation of the national judge can never concern the compatibility of the aid. Only the commission can decide on the compatibility. The national judge can only decide on the unlawfulness. Deciding on the unlawfulness means that there is a prima facie evaluation of the fact that it is an aid, the measure is an aid under Article 107, Paragraph 1. But indeed, it's not always so simple to identify prima facie an aid. So, this is the crucial question in this, in this, uh, uh, in this assessment moment because we could say, okay, in any case there is a doubt, there is, the judge should 
I mean, we could think about a notification. But this is to be valid for the member state. So in case of doubt, the member state is just notified. But not for the national <coughs> judge, because the national judge must decide if, must preliminarily decide if it's prima facie aid in order to see if it uh, should or not, must or not order the recovery. So the national court must make a decision. But certainly it's not, it's not, uh, uh, it's not uh, so, so easy. But this is really the crucial issue concerning, concerning the competence of national judges. So what the court says, in case of doubt, there is the preliminary rule. emphasizes the role of national courts and national judges. And the, because in this case, it's really up exclusively to the national judge to decide as an EU court, yes. so apply EU law. And yes, there is always the possibility to refer to the Court of Justice, but it is exclusive competence of the national judge to assure in these specific situations the correct application of EU law <coughs> and the protection of the states. And uh, we can see again an important <coughs> passage, we can read together an important passage of, uh, uh, of, uh, of, the, of the Court of Justice based on what we, we said on the application of, uh, uh, of Article 108, Paragraph 3, which is an, an, an obligation to protect. Consequently, the Court of Justice has ruled that national court must guarantee individuals affected by a breach of Article 108, Paragraph 3, that all necessary inferences will be drawn in accordance with the national law, as regards the validity of the measures giving effect to the aid, the recovery, and therefore also the expectations, or the application of possible injury measures. And why is this so important? Because in the Boussac and Toubemeuse cases, the court expressly said that the Commission cannot order the recovery only on the basis of the fact that the, the aid has not been notified. So, the Commission must complete the entire compatibility procedure, evaluate a lawfulness and compatibility or incompatibility, and only after the entire procedure is completed, then it can order the recovery. But not before that moment. But then what about the case, the case that we were dealing with? What about the period of the standstill obligation? What about competitors, possibility of recovery, legitimate expectation? for the period concerning the standstill obligation, where the protection of taxpayers for that period is completely up to its national court. So, an extremely important, uh, important role, because uh, actually the Commission has power to uh, release preliminary recovery injunctions, but uh, 
under very strict conditions. So it, it hardly applies that condition, which is Article 13 of the procedural of the procedural regulation. Otherwise, it is complete. The protection of rights <coughs> of individuals affected by article by a breach of Article 108, Paragraph 3, is completely up to national uh, to national court and. Uh, This is actually very much emphasized by the Court of Justice. The Court of Justice always say, and then I come back to what we said about being EU, an EU court, that the role of the Commission and the role of national judges is a complementary but different role. Because only the Commission, we saw, can assess the Incompatibility or incompatibility. The national court can never evaluate a measure on the basis of, compat of the compatibility or incompatibility para parameters, and therefore under 7.2 or 3 or the other relevant, the other relevant provisions. On the other hand, we have just seen the Commission cannot order recovery before having, having completed the, the, the procedure. Therefore, only national courts can decide for the period concerning uh, unlawfulness. And this is very much emphasized by the Court of Justice in, in, its, uh, in its case law. And consequently, also uh, emphasized by the Commission in the 2009 notice on the role of national courts, in which the Commission, indeed, on the basis of the case law of the Court of Justice, expressly say that uh, uh, national judges must guarantee the full recovery and consequently also taking into consideration protection of legitimate expectation independently and uh, regardless of any uh, compatibility assessment conducted by the Commission. What does it mean? This has been very much has been clarified by the, uh, the Court of Justice in the SFEI case. The Court has stated the initiation by the Commission of a preliminary examination procedure under Article now 108, Paragraph 3 or Paragraph 2 cannot release national courts from their duty to safeguard the rights of individuals in the event of a breach of the requirements to give prior notification. Article 108, paragraph 3, as direct effect, is immediate uh, enforceable. This immediate, enforce this immediate protection must be granted to taxpayers, which means that a national judge can wait uh, uh, for the final decision of the Commission, only if there is a real reason to wait, but all, not Merely in, or, merely in order to wait for the commission of the decision, in order to avoid conflicts, for example. This is not possible according to the Court of Justice, because uh, Article 108, Paragraph 3 has direct effect, immediate protection must be guaranteed, and only national courts can guarantee this immediate, this immediate uh, uh, protection. could order recovery, taking into consideration uh, legitimate expectations and then <coughs> decide that the recovery uh, should not be implemented, uh, could declare, but this is more indeed for administrative judges, um, the invalidity of the measures that uh, uh, implement a lawful aid, a decree, uh, any, any legal, internal legal source must actually, we will see that, be declared invalid, uh, can take into consideration uh, damages, claim, but can also uh, um, decide uh, uh, on uh, uh, interim measures. So it can order the recovery or the interim recovery. For example, the Commission also states if 
uh, exactly speaking about the immediate enforceability. So the fact that the Commission cannot merely suspend uh, a procedure only because uh, uh, the judge wants to wait. There, there should be a reasonable uh, reason, uh, motivation in order to suspend and therefore, and therefore to uh, delay the protection of, of the taxpayer. Um, the, the Commission suggests in this case, if the, if the national judges, judge considers necessary to wait for the decision of the, of the Commission, to take at least interim measures. And the Commission even says that the Court could order the uh, um, creation of a, a blocked account and order the recovery, the, reco the interim recovery. So the money is put on a blocked account and then depending on the decision of the Commission they will give them back or... Uh, so there are many, many dif different situations. Indeed it depends on uh, national procedures or competence of civil uh, tax or uh, administrative judges, but there are, there are, uh, there are many, many measures that can be taken. Maybe what is also interesting to emphasize is that uh, indeed all these powers are emphasized if they are uh, correctly ruled under national law. Because the procedures, so this is the substance, but the so EU law gives the substance of the power, but, uh, EU, but EU law, but national law uh, should make this power procedurally possible. So it is also uh, very important that member states use uh, appropriate procedural rules, recovery procedures, for example. Because then it is national law that says exactly how to proceed, and that guarantees that these substantial powers then are formally implemented under national law. Yes, yes, it is until the, 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 um, the, the Commission has made the decision. Again, the connection between EU law and national law and national procedural law is extremely relevant. So the procedure, as I said, in order to implement correctly the substantial law must be appropriately defined under national, under national law. So we said, yes, that uh, uh, the court and consequently the commission <coughs> emphasize that um, uh, the, the court must guarantee this protection regardless of any, um, regardless and independently from any decision taken by, uh, which, which is going on before, before the commission. This is emphasized in the SFEI case which also says again, any other interpretation would have the effect of encouraging the member states to disregard the prohibition on implementation of Plan A and indeed undermine the effectiveness of Article 108 paragraph 3. This is also always a constant reference of the court, which in light of what we said earlier this, this, this morning is, uh, mm, is also uh, important, uh, important to uh, to highlight. Therefore, we saw that uh, uh, yes, again, the the, the the court has emphasized in its, in its case law the, the autonomy, the important role, the, the, the autonomy of uh, uh, of national courts, which we said cannot wait merely for waiting the, the final decision of, of, uh, of the Commission. This protection must be guaranteed even while uh, the Commission is in the process of taking a decision. Exactly because, we said, Article 108, Paragraph 3 is immediate enforceable. This autonomy of the, uh, of the national courts is very much emphasized in this case, the FNCE case, 
which is a very interesting, uh, interesting case. Uh, this case started before the Court of Justice with a preliminary ruling of the French uh, um, State Court, the, admin, the, second, the administrative court of uh, second instance, the uh, State Council, yes. Conseil d'État. Conseil d'État. So I will tra translate uh, State Council in English, I don't know. But, so the second, the second uh, level of administrative uh, and uh, um, because France uh, had introduced parafiscal uh, advantages, parafiscal charges, in favor of a public fund which was operating in the sector of uh, uh, sea uh, fishing. The, aid, uh, the measure was actually notified by the, the, the French government to, to, the, to the Commission, but in the meantime, while the Commission was uh, uh, deciding, the French uh, government adopted an interministerial order and uh, ordered the implementation of the parafiscal charges. Mm -hmm. So the measures were implemented during the standstill period while the Commission was still deciding, in the process of, of deciding. And in the end, the Commission uh, concluded that the measures were compatible with the internal market. But FNCE, which is the National uh, Fund for International Commerce or Food, uh, an international, a uh, national uh, uh, French institution, started proceedings before the administrative court. And uh, uh, which then arrived at the State Council, and the State Council referred the question to the Court of Justice. And it asked whether Article 108, Paragraph 3 should be interpreted as determining the invalidity of the national measures which unlawfully implement national measures. <coughs> So we said there was the, uh, the, pro the, the Commission was in the process of deciding, but the interministerial order was issued and the, an interministerial order uh, implemented the end. So the court asked uh, Article 108, now 108, paragraph 3, has been breached. Is this breach? imply an obligation for the national judge to order, to, to, to declare the interministerial order as invalid? And is this the case even when eventually the Commission concluded the procedure positively? So by stating that the measure, although a local, is compatible with the internal market? Very interestingly, the court stated, any measure which unlawfully implements implement, uh, national measure is invalid and this must be and the measure must be declared as invalid by the national court. And this is even true when in the end there is a positive decision of the Commission. This was a very important case because it really distinguished the period of unlawfulness and the period concerning the um, decision of the Commission. And it really emphasized that before the Commission takes the decision, there is a period in which uh, only national courts <coughs> can guarantee protection of, of the rights of individuals and factors. So, there is a very important differentiation between the two moments and between the competence of the, 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 the Commission and the National Court and really emphasize the complementary uh, relationship between the, two, between the two institutions. Unfortunately, oh yes, I, I, I think it is interesting to read also this passage, but uh, the content is what I said. It must be stated that the Commission's final decision 
does not have the effect of regularizing ex post facto the implementing measures which were invalid because they had been taken in breach of the prohibition laid down by the last sentence of Article now 100, uh, 108, paragraph 3, since otherwise the direct effect of that prohibition would be impaired and the interest of individuals which, as stated above, are to be protected by national courts, could be disregarded. So, the decisions of the Commission do not have retroactive effect. This is the conclusion of the court, at least in this, in this judgment. No retroactive effect. And again, the court emphasized any other interpretation would have the effect of according a favorable outcome to non-observance by the member state concerned of the last sentence of Article 93, paragraph 3, and would deprive that provision of its effectiveness. I think here again, coming back very briefly to what we were saying earlier, it is very much emphasized the fact that the, that the, the, the obligation is for the member state, which creates concerns about what we said before on the position of the diligent, of the diligent businessmen. So for, the, for EU law, there is an obligation of the member states, but in fact, the, 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 the legitimate expectations, it's, the concept it applies almost as strictly for the, for the, for the businessmen than, than as for the, for the member state. But, As I said in the FNCE case, the court emphasized the, the autonomy of the competence of, uh, of national, of national uh, courts. Unfortunately, it is difficult to see the coherence between that previous case and the, the, see the self case, which has been decided relatively recently in, uh, in uh, uh, 2006. In this case, the court makes an important distinction between, decision, between positive decisions of the Commission, so which are concluded with an evaluation on the compatibility of the aid, and negative decisions. And the court states that when the Commission has taken a negative decision and after this decision the national court should evaluate legitimate expectations. In this case, the court has said that it's again completely up to the national judge to evaluate whether the, the, the circumstances gave rise or not to legitimate expectations. So, when there is a negative decision of the commission and the judge has to decide after this decision, the autonomy of the national courts is again acknowledged by the Court of Justice. But things change on the basis of, uh, uh, of this judgment according to the Court when the Commission has concluded with a, with a positive decision the assessment. And in this case, the court has taken a very particular position because it has said that if the Commission has assessed that the aid is compatible, there is no obligation for national courts to uh, order the recovery. And if we think of it, we see that this conclusion is not completely coherent with the fact that the Commission, that uh, the Court has previously uh, emphasized the fact that there is the period of the standstill clause during which spares and individuals must be protected. The following, the, 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 the reasoning of the Court is the following. And it is, yes, it is true that there is a period, a standstill period, during which we must protect individuals for the period of unlawfulness. 
because it is clear that even if the measure is in the end considered compatible, certainly it has been uh, applied earlier, which means that competitors have started earlier to be in a disadvantageous position. If the procedure under Article 108, Paragraph 3 is followed, the measure is implemented only after the decision of the Commission, and therefore the disadvantage for the competitor starts only as from the moment of the notification of the Commission. So, this is something that uh, it, has to, it must be taken into consideration. The Court said, yes, this is true, but the only advantage that a competitor would have or has when the measure is unlawfully implemented is that this, the, the, the beneficiary does not pay interest for an amount that it would otherwise be received from a bank, for example. So, it received earlier an amount from the state. Uh, if this beneficiary could not count on the amount received by the state, it would have taken this amount privately from a bank and it would have paid interest. So, the only advantage that the beneficiary has in the standstill period is that it didn't pay interest. This is the position of the court. And therefore, national courts, in this case, must order recovery of interest. So, according to the Court of Justice, no obligation to recover the amount, only obligation to recover the interest. The Court also adds, it is possible that the national court may order recovery under the national definition of legitimate expectations. So these are the main findings of these, uh, in this judgment, which certainly limits the FMCE case in recognizing the... So, for okay. example, in the Starbucks case, concerning a ruling between the Dutch government and uh, beneficiary, not the national, suppose that uh, after all the European courts will approve this ruling and will decide that it is not state aid, then still the Dutch government must recover the interest from the moment that this ruling has been uh, decided upon and the decision of the, the final decision of the European Court. In that case, it is determined by, uh, so you say, the Commission, uh, so in the end, the, the, the Court will say that it's not, uh, uh, that it's not a state aid. Eh? So it's, it's uh, compatible with European law. Yes. But, as I understand, uh, and as, uh, so we, we know that this ruling has not been notified anymore. Oh, yes, for the period of unlawfulness, yes. Then, for this period, the Dutch government must still recover yes. the interest yes. uh, upon the uh, Although in that case it's also up to, but yes, there is, it's also up to the Commission the, the, to decide on the, on the different possibilities, but yeah. What is the concern? Because, uh, because of the, um, Oh yes, because yes, you are saying when it's not when it's because now I'm thinking uh, the Commission decides the recovery and the, and the recovery of interest. But you are speaking about the situation in which it's compatible in the end, but a lot. Yes, 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 yes. Okay. yes. But actually, I see. Uh, uh, <coughs> 
some points of incoherence with the previous FNCE case. First of all, concerning the, the fact that the court states uh, in, the, in, the, in, the, in the self case that there is no obligation for the, for the national judge. This is the only thing that uh, the court says. There is no obligation for the national judges. It means that there are also cases in which uh, national judges should or could autonomously decide that uh, the recovery should be ordered. However, the court has not given any indication, any parameter, which the national courts should uh, apply in order to evaluate whether the recovery uh, should be ordered or not. Which may be a problem if we think in terms of coordination between, uh, uh, between member states and protection of taxpayer within the internal market. Because if there are no indications or not yet indications from the court, it means that uh, the national judge will apply parameters which are related to, uh, to EU law, but basically uh, national, national parameters, which means that uh, in each country there could be different parameters on the basis of which judges decide, decide, decide when or the recovery or not after a positive decision of the Commission. So I think this is a very important issue on the basis of what parameters should the National Court decide even when the, when the, the measure is compatible that, the, there, is the, that there should be recovery. Another problem that I see is that uh, in the FNCE case, the court, the court expressly says that in any case the measure is invalid subsequently to the uh, breach of Article 108, Paragraph 3. So, at national level, there is an invalid measure, but still the court uh, can avoid Recall. I think this is a very important uh, incoherence because the measure, because the invalidity of the measure does not uh, depend on national law, but on the breach on the breach of EU law. So, so there is certainly uh, certainly an invalidity, but uh, still there is no recovery. So this is just to say that uh, there are many issues that the relationship between national courts and uh, the, the Commission is very delicate, very interesting, very problematic. And this is something of which national, national courts should be aware of. Uh, taking into consideration again the very important tool consisting in preliminary ruling, that's always an important tool for, 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 national, for national courts. But I think we can also emphasize that although the EU concept of legitimate expectation is rather strict under EU law, there is also a very significant role that the court has recognized to national judges. And I think, yes, this is a very important merit of EU law and, and the, court, the court of justice. So this is my this is my presentation. I don't know if you have further questions or doubts or comments on this issue. <coughs>